to the Career Management Podcast for Black Women, where we unapologetically help you navigate your workplace crazy. I'm your host, Felicia Ann Rose Anuha, also known as the Trill MBA. Why? Because I'm the Trillist MBA you will ever know. And every week, we are going to bring you the tips, tricks, and tactics you need to survive and thrive in the workplace. So if you like our content, subscribe, like, leave comments, let us know what workplace crazy you need help with. We got you. It really doesn't have to be that hard. As you'll learn in today's episode, where we are dropping gems, let's start the show. Welcome back to the show. I am so excited today because we have a very special in-studio guest. You guys, last season I shared with you that I am transitioning from working in CPG and food to entertainment and media. And when I tell you trying to change industries is crazy. And I'm so excited to have somebody with me and know that I am not alone. And my special guest today is not only a classically trained CPG marketer, but she's also a feature filmmaker She has finished her second film and is currently on the film festival circuit, winning awards. I am so excited, you guys. I want to introduce you to Sakita Lewis. She is a director, a writer, a producer from the south side of Chicago. She co-founded Lewis Taylor Productions with her husband and partner, Brandon Lewis. It is a Texas-based film company founded in 2014, and their first feature film was Jericho, um, which was independently financed and produced, which is hard as hell, but garnered 14 festival awards from best film to best actor, right? So this also includes for Sakita, she won the best new director from the Women's International Film Festival in 2016. So that was her first film, guys. And that film, Jericho, is in nationwide release. You can get it at Walmart. You can find it on Amazon and multiple streaming platforms. But not only that, Sakita is a graduate of both Southern University and Cornell. And she has a bachelor's of science and master's in electrical engineering, respectively. She also holds an MBA from Duke. (laughs) And she has been a marketing executive for over 15 years, guys. She has a wealth of knowledge, and I can't wait to dive into this conversation with her today. Sakita, welcome to the show, girl. (laughs) Thank you, Felicia. I love that introduction. It makes me sound so cool. You, (laughs) first of all, I only hang out with the coolest people, okay? Like... (laughs) I'm so excited to have you here because I feel like we're sisters in trying to get out of CPG. (laughs) (laughs) Trying to get out of corporate and get on with like making stories and telling (laughs) stories. And so I really appreciate you for just letting me into a part of your, your life here today because I'm going to ask you all the questions so I need you to promise me something yes. are you going to keep it true I'm going to keep it true okay because <laughs> you're so sweet and nice I be feeling bad y'all because I be talking to the innocent ones like Sakita <laughs> and I'm a bad influence so no, no. <laughs> although I did find out this trip Sakita likes to dance I do I do <laughs> which I love that because I like to dance too so Let's start from the beginning, okay? Okay. Because it sounds like, because you went from engineering, and what I did not know is that you have a master's degree in engineering, too. So you were deeply rooted in this engineering. (laughs) Very deeply. (laughs) Who lied to you? I don't know if anybody lied to me. I think when I first, when I was a kid, when I first started out, I was enamored. So yeah, I loved watching movies. I loved animatronics, which I don't I don't know if anyone even knows what those are anymore. But those were the robots and all the things that they did in movies to make things look cool, like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and all of that stuff. Like I loved that mm-hmm. and I wanted to do that. Mm. And so as a kid, you know, as you, you hear doctor, lawyer, 
engineer, like, you know, the good, you know, those good, stable jobs as a kid. To me, that meant, okay, is that engineer? Because Mm -hmm. I want to make these things. I want to work in this space and create. And so that's what led me down the engineering path. Uh, You know, so starting off, I wanted to be like an Imagineer, like a Disney Imagineer. Like I was going to go and create, you know, all of these incredible experiences. Right. But that, but I ended up in telecom. <laughs> uh, you know, so I went to school. I went to Southern. You know, had an incredible undergrad experience <laughs> at HBCU. <laughs> um, and but Disney doesn't recruit at Southern University. You know, and so that path of how do you how do you get into this space just wasn't clear. Yeah. And so um, Hewlett Packard and did a lot of recruiting there, and uh, so they recruited me out of Southern. Um, into the the program at Cornell, and so uh, that's how I, I ended up going, you know, into engineering, and how I ended up getting my master's because I was working with Cornell, I mean, working with Hewlett Packard, mm-hmm. and you know that was telecom. Oh, so that was the beginning of my career, right? And so you got sucked in. I got sucked in. It was it was great company. You know, I I enjoyed what I was doing, mm-hmm. but it didn't give me you know the heart. You weren't letters. imagineering. I wasn't okay. imagineering. I wasn't. I was doing inkjet printers, and you know, <laughs> and you know, I'm so- glad you <laughs> found that to be fun I guess right. or I you liked it I I enjoy the people you know okay. I'm a people person because inkjet there's nothing no, sexy there about was, inkjet there, it wasn't sexy but I enjoyed the company I enjoyed the people and then I ended up landing in Texas mm-hmm. so I landed in Richardson Texas with Agilent Technologies which mm-hmm. was a subsidiary like you know, it was part of HP at the time and I was doing telecom And I was the first college grad to get into this team of mostly, you know, elder men (laughs) that had been in their job for 30 plus years. And here's this kid coming in and they were great. They loved me. They supported me. But I would I think it the the light bulb went off like one time we were going to lunch and they were talking about all the new gadgets and gizmos. And I was sitting there at that table like completely uninterested in what we were talking about, what they were talking about around me. And I realized this isn't where I'm supposed to be. I don't want to do this for the next 30 years. This isn't my passion. It's not my hope. Like the, during that whole time, you know, I was like taking creative writing classes on the side and like I was filling my cup in other ways. Mm-hmm. But I realized that this wasn't the right day job for me to be doing. I wanted to be more creative. Right. Um, and so I said, maybe I'll go back to business school. Right. Because business school <laughs> is the ultimate. Let Transition me switch. Point. Yeah. <laughs> Let me pivot. Yeah. Let me take two years off. Go Let me have my, a little fun. Yeah. Go find myself. Right. Right. And at the time, you know, film didn't still didn't occur to me as a career. Mm-hmm. It was more so, OK, what's something that's more creative that I can have more fun with? You know, marketing feels like what mm-hmm. that should be. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, having that moment of realizing engineering wasn't it. Mm-hmm. And what what career would be more creative for me? Um, I still didn't think about film and entertainment and all of that. I thought of marketing. Mm. And so business school is the perfect way to make a transition from one career to another. Like, I don't know how else you go from engineering to marketing. You don't. (laughs) You don't. Except for business school. Except for business school. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, found- Or work at P&G. Oh, interesting. If you work at P&G, I think they do get their engineers. Because, you know, and P&G loves a good engineer MBA. Yeah, 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 that's true. So, yeah, so went to Duke, had a great time there. Ended up being recruited by Frito-Lay, which was crazy because I was already living in Dallas, Fort Worth. And when I went to Duke, to North Carolina, I thought, okay, you know, new city, new experiences. I'm going to go, you know, (laughs) spread my wings and wherever I land. And then I got recruited from Frito. Had no idea that they literally were five minutes from where I lived in Dallas before. Oh, wow. (laughs) So it was meant to be. I came back, you know, and did 10 years with Frito-Lay. That's a long time. That's a long time. I didn't realize it had been 10 years. 10 years, yeah. So did you get caught up in layoffs? I didn't get caught up in layoffs at Frito. Okay. But then when I left Frito-Lay, I was going to focus on film for a little while. Okay, so you were like, I'm... 2018 hustling 2018 
I'm because you've been doing film on the side, right? And you had made Jericho at this time. Jericho was out, yeah. And you were like, okay, we got some distribution. Yeah. I'm starting to learn how this works. This whole film thing, yes. I'm gonna go for it, right? And so you know, we like you said, we I did uh, Jericho on the side, so vacations, right. nights, weekends. <laughs> That's crazy, Sakita. I know. It it's is. a whole feature film. It's a whole feature film. How many days did you shoot Jericho? I want to say 16 days. In did total. you even get 16 days of. Yeah, I had been there for a while. So oh. I had a lot of vacation, but I shot, like, I took two weeks vacation mm-hmm. and shot those two weeks. And then we shot some weekends and pickups here and there. Okay. Mm-hmm, in order to pull it together. Wow. Yeah. So did you have a vacation that year? No. Not a I, I don't think I've had a real vacation since then. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> yeah. That's dedication. Yeah. Like it really, really is. I yeah. commend you because Thank you. I hustle slow. Yeah. I need sleep. Well, yeah, and I think it is. It's a slower process. If I were a full time filmmaker, yeah, things would happen more, more faster. Mm-hmm. But you know, I was enjoying my job. You mm-hmm. know what I was doing, yeah. and I feel like you know when people think of the side hustle or they think of it like, is it taking away from what you're doing? And I think of it like this: like everyone has a passion, mm-hmm. and for some people, you know, they may want to spend their free time laying on a beach mm-hmm. or reading a book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to make films. So, like, my free time is going to be dedicated to that, right, to what Mm -hmm. I love. And, you know, you should probably find some time to lay on a beach sometime, too. (laughs) I mean, just, you know, it'd be good. But that's what I love to do. Like, when I went to Ocean Spray, I had a leader there who was in a band. Like, my boss at that time... um, wonderful gentleman he led a band and he would do gigs on the weekend <laughs> he would go back home to ohio and do gigs did you ever go i, I never i never got the chance okay. to see him perform but that was what he did you know He's and so a whole band having dates <laughs> yeah and i think some of the best organizations are ones that encourage that because like he knew all about my filmmaking and he was like that's awesome like yeah. when it's let me know when i can come to a screening that's what's you know? up mm-hmm. that's what's up listen we are gonna take a quick break so we can let you two pay some bills um hopefully if you're listening on your podcast player there's an ad here <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be right back with sakita lewis filmmaker we're gonna be talking about transitioning from working full-time to a, being a full-time filmmaker when we come back guys welcome back so sakita we are going to talk about transition so you've transitioned into full-time filmmaking now yes so do you plan to go back to corporate or are you gonna just ride this wave of uncertainty (laughs) i think you know what to me if i found the perfect space Mm -hmm. the space where I can bring both halves of who I am yes. into one, then I would go back. Okay. I would, you know, because I love story, I love brand, I love entertainment. And I feel like there's an opportunity for all of those things to live together. Mm-hmm. And I feel like some of the best work is when we see those come together. I did a brand storytelling event this past January, mm-hmm. and it was companies like John Deere funding work. Um, it was it was a film called Gaining Ground, which is awesome. Go see it. Okay. It's a documentary about black farmers losing their land in the South. Oh, wow. Right? So important topic. Yes. Sponsored by a brand, John Deere. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, there's no, like, there's not a ton of John Deere branding. It's really about the story. Mm-hmm. They piloted a program to help support education for the farmers because they're the amount of black farmers that have lost their land over the years is mm-hmm. ridiculous. And yes. It's still happening because of, you know, things like heirs property and people. So it's, it's a Slavery. whole thing. Yes. <laughs> but from there right. all the way to today where, you know, um, and I, <laughs> I'm going on a whole tangent, no. but all the way to today where a black landowner might say, I'm going to leave this to my children equally. 
right? Mm -hmm. Those children have children and those children have children. Right. So maybe now you have like 50 people who have interest in a piece of land. Right. And maybe they've never been there. They're a kid that lives far away. They don't know anything about the land. Right. They don't care about the land. Right. So those people are found and they're targeted oh, by someone to so, buy yeah. that 150th of the property. Yeah. Well, because of how land rights work, that person who buys it can try to force the, the land to be sold. Mm. So even though they don't have a majority, they can go to a, a judge to say, you know, what's the best use of this? Well, selling is the best use. I want my money out of it, so you gotta sell it. So yeah. that's a whole thing, right? Yeah. But that's an issue that John Deere is bringing light to that oh, then gives, you know, brand equity mm -hmm. to John Deere. For anyone who sees it, it's like, man, they're doing something important. Let me go buy a tractor. Right, well, if I'm in the tractor market, right. <laughs> and I'm looking at John Deere versus whoever else, mm -hmm. I might say, you know what, I'm going with that because that matters. Yeah. And so I think that there's a space where storytelling and entertainment can come together. Mm -hmm. And I love that space. Yes. So I love that. I love the independent things that we're doing on our own as well, because mm -hmm. those are stories that are personal to us, mm -hmm. things that have come from our experiences. And so, you know, we're, I'm writing all the time of just things that come to me. But so the perfect space would be a space where I have all of that. Right. And, um, you know, all put together in one. So tell me about, speaking of storytellers, Yeah, it's not just you, it's also your husband. Yes. So how is it working with your husband? <laughs> yeah. Like how do y'all stay together this long? Cause y'all have been together what, 12 years 12 now? 12 years, yeah. And not like kill each other. <laughs> because I don't know about you, but <laughs> I don't like all my coworkers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I love this one coworker. <laughs> yes. I will keep him around. Um, we made it through the pandemic, you know, the all those thing. hours in the house together. Um, but, you know, I would say working with Brandon is a gift, mm -hmm. but it is also, you know, we, we learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And so we challenge each other. And so I think that's the best thing about working with him because he knows me so well. I know him so well. So I know when he has further that he can go. I know it. Right. Because right. I know him. Right. So I know when I can like say, hey, you, you can do you can go through this next scene. I know you can do it. Um, and with me, he's like, hey, you know he pushes and supports me to do exactly what I want to do with some of the shots and things that I have, you know, support me in the room, right? When right. we have a crew full of folks that are st people starting to get tired and starting to get, you know, a little antsy, like having him as a support is really important. And so I think it helps with the shorthand, like of what we want to get accomplished because we know each other so well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it makes it harder sometimes on set, especially if we're going through like an emotional scene because I'm watching the scene as a director in the moment, but I'm also watching the seem as his wife so I'm like he crying I'm crying you know <laughs> so so you're you're even more invested in this moment mm -hmm. but I think it's a good challenge which reminds me like let's talk about impossible yeah or I'm possible as yes. I like to call it so this is your new feature film yes I got to see it for the first time at the festival, like all together. I remember when I read the script, um, disclaimer, mm -hmm. I am a co-producer of this project very proudly. <laughs> um, I believe in the project, but King, from your words as director, writer, co-writer, tell us about Impossible. Yeah, so Impossible is a, is a movie that follows a man diagnosed with type 2 diabetes on his journey to change and save his life and go after a dream to be a police officer. What's special about the movie is that it's inspired by Brandon's real life, mm -hmm. right? So he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes after Jericho. So on okay. the set of Jericho, he was not feeling right, mm -hmm. hadn't been to the doctor in two years because apparently the doctor had told him that he was pre-diabetic, oh. but he just didn't go back. Um, and so on the set, he started feel bad he went and they told him hey you're you know you have type 2 diabetes and in that journey for him when he did decide to tell me because <laughs> it was a you know it was a lack and and we know like statistically men don't go to the doctor nope. as much as women um, and so that's just something that we wanted to highlight also is to get our men to go to the doctor mm -hmm. but when we had the conversation it was more so you know what do we need to do what do we need to change we want to make sure you're okay and that conversation led us to say, this is our next project because this is important. The conversation we're having, people are having around the mm -hmm. world or people are not having around mm -hmm. the world because they're in denial. They don't want to face it. They don't want to talk about it. So that was the impetus for making the film. It's loosely based on his life. Um, and, you know, he plays himself in the film mm -hmm. for him. 
you know, when someone tells you you have to make a complete lifestyle change, yeah. that's that's big. That's a lot. It's like, okay, I want you to lose a bunch of weight. I want you to change everything that you've ever known about yourself and, yeah. and everything that you do. And so it's become an accountability partner for him because it's so hard to make that change. Yes. Doing it in public <laughs> with all of these eyes and all these people counting on you um, has allowed him to, that added pressure has allowed him to stay focused. Mm-hmm. So I'm very proud of him and his journey and where he is and he continues on his journey. Mm -hmm. We hope this film, when people see what he's accomplished so far, will invite people to say, hey, I can do that too. Mm -hmm. Let me get on board and and join him as he continues his journey. Go Go to the doctor. Go get your numbers checked. Find out where you are and then know that you can make an impact on it. You can change it, but you have to get that. You have to start. You have to go to the doctor Mm -hmm. in order to, you know, make it happen. Yes. And I am just so inspired by both of you because a lot of people would not have a positive reaction, right, to hearing that my partner has type 2 diabetes and, you know, would you guys have made it a partnership in mm-hmm. let's get healthy like yeah. even though so Sakita's in town for the Pan-African Film Festival and so that's how she's in studio today thank you Pan-African Film Festival for bringing all these wonderful people to town this week but just seeing you guys together and I saw how you you know having this glimpse of you guys partnering and now you have this 16 month old so you guys just had a baby not that long ago congratulations thank you (laughs) and then watching Brandon go get up every morning go to the gym even you know on quote unquote a trip right and I know I'm terrible I don't exercise while I'm traveling traveling (laughs) like I'll go walking outside right but like go to a gym like I do when I'm here? No. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm not doing that. Yeah, I mean he's he's dedicated to the you know, he's dedicated to the goal. And we like I said, we had our little girl after we finished filming, so that was just one more reason mm-hmm. for him and for me to say we wanna be here as long as possible to, for her. We wanna right. be here when she gets married and all of those things. And so, you know, he says like, you know, I look at you, I look at her, and that's like what's pushing me to keep going so that I can be as healthy as possible. And, you know, no one knows what will happen, but at least the things that we can control, like to, as much as possible to do what we can to be here for her. Mm-hmm. And so it is a partnership. You know, like you said, he, he go to, he'll go to the gym and I'll take care of the baby or whatever the things that we mm-hmm. got to do in order to, you know, to get it done. Yes. I'm so proud of y'all. We're going to take a real quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the most important thing that you have learned as a filmmaker. Oh, okay. When we get back. Most important thing. All right, guys, we are back with Sakita Lewis, uh, producer, director, wife, mom, all things, marketer, executive, all the things. Um, I am so honored that you would come on my show. Um, I really had fun working with you when we were at Frito. Thank you. Um, the few times that we did get to, you know, act up. <laughs> oh, I acted up all the time. But <laughs> I mean, you have to make work fun. You do. You really um, do. So before we wrap up, I just want you to, and I ask this of every guest, like, What's the most important thing that you've learned about your career? Like, what would you go back and tell your younger self? Like, what's that one nugget of truth that if I had just known this? (laughs) (laughs) That's a great question. I think for me and looking back, I think it's just to always be authentically you. I feel like there's different parts of my career where I felt like I needed to, like when I was an engineer, like I need to like fit in with the guys or because, you know, I may have been the only woman around or um, when I got to corporate America, it's like, you know, what, what's the, how am I supposed to be as a leader? Am I supposed to be this kind of leader or that kind of leader? And I think just being authentically who I am so that, you know, every day at the end of the day, I feel good about the choices I made, the people that I've Mm -hmm. impacted, the groups that I get involved with because it it matters to me. Mm -hmm. And so doing those things that make you, that, that make you feel good about the impact you're making on the world. Mm -hmm. And that's authentically you and how you are that you're not kind of 
bending into these different spaces because it feels like the right thing to do to be successful. I feel like if you're authentically yourself and you're living in that truth, you know, you'll find the right places to be, the right people to be involved with, the right organizations to be a part of. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that would be my biggest thing. I wish somebody had told me that when I was younger <laughs> because, I mean, you've worked with me. I don't fit. <laughs> I just don't. And I try because you can tell now, like you've seen yeah. me in my own space, my own element. This but, is you. Yeah, this is your space. But when I was working, I don't know. Do you remember? Like, I feel like I was a shell of myself. I, I don't feel like I was truly because I was so busy trying to be accepted. Right. Right. And I'm just not acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> not acceptable <laughs> to them to who, right to me right 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 <laughs> not acceptable for yeah. them <laughs> yeah yeah I, th I think that's part of like finding finding your path yeah. is like okay this path may not be the right fit for me so let me find the path that fits you know where i want to go and the things that i want to do and that's what i want to break people out of yeah. because we've so been indoctrinated with go to school get a good job and it's like okay i do that but I don't that's not really yeah what I was supposed to be doing in the first place yeah I tell my niece you know she's just started in college and I tell anyone really <laughs> like the career you start in might not be the career you end in you might mm -hmm. change a hundred times and that's okay that's just part of your path you were supposed to do that thing because it's going to inform and influence the next thing and until you find the thing that's the right thing for you and it may be the right thing for this season of your life and it might not be the right thing for the next season of your life it's just life ebbs and flows and so and i think about people being afraid to pick a major or things of that mm -hmm. sort like in five years you might not even care about the thing that you chose but that's okay you can pivot to the next mm -hmm. thing that might be the best thing for you yeah don't be afraid of the pivots yeah i think is yeah because i think that's what people are anticipating because mm -hmm. it does feel hard to pivot yeah but change is hard yeah and i think you know you're trying to troubleshoot for that when you're young and yeah over time, you just realize, like, I don't have time to waste. Yeah, just do it. Yeah. Do the thing. And if you don't like the thing, then you'll do something else. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Sakita, thank you so much for being on the show. I really, really appreciate this. Thank you for and having me. I think a lot of people are going to resonate with your story. Well, guys, that's a wrap on another great episode of the Career Management Podcast for Black Women. Yes, girl, this show is just for you. We're here to tell you how to play that chessboard at work, girl. So subscribe, comment, like, follow us on social media at Trill and BA Show. Listen, every time you tell one of your friends, you share this information, you share this podcast, it helps us to grow and make even more dope content just for you, unapologetically. That's why we're here. Now, if you are facing a workplace dilemma, such as a performance improvement plan, or you're not able to secure your promotion and raise that you have worked for and you have deserved, basically, if these people are play playing in your face, we are here to help. Go to trillmba.com slash coaching to schedule a one-time one-on-one call to workshop your specific dilemma with me or schedule a consult to get more information about the consulting packages that I do offer on a longer term basis. As always, you can reach out to us with your listener letters and your questions at trillmba.com. Until next time, guys, focus on your best possible outcome. Ask for help when you need it. Please, please, please ask for help. And as always, keep it trill. I'll see y'all next week.